Welcome to the Learning Shared Podcast. Hello, my name is Alan Wood and I'm your host. Thanks very much for listening. So Learning Shared is a space for anyone with an interest in supporting the needs of vulnerable learners in our society, including those with special educational needs and disabilities. We'll be hearing from and talking with a wide range of colleagues and stakeholders, including teachers, specialist practitioners, school leaders, researchers, as well as parents and carers. They'll be sharing creative, inspiring ideas, effective practice and things they've learned along their journey. With that in mind, please get in touch if you'd like to suggest a topic for a future episode or if you'd like to be involved in any way. You can visit us at www.learningshared.org or tweet us at underscore learning shared. The Learning Shared podcast is brought to you by Evidence for Learning and the EFL Send community. This is a growing community of teachers, practitioners, school leaders, researchers and academics that support children, young people and adults with special educational needs and disabilities or indeed any form of additional learning needs. You can find out more about the EFL Send community and Evidence for Learning at www.evidenceforlearning.net. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, in this episode, our guest presenter, Sharon Gray, OBE, provides a presentation. Sharon shares the approach and some of the work that is being done to support the recovery process across a federation and family of schools in and around Derbyshire, led by Embark Federation. We've put a link to a video of Sharon's presentation on the Recovery Curriculum website at www.recoverycurriculum.org and if you select episode 7, you'll be able to watch and listen to the slideshow. Professor Barry Carpenter introduces Sharon. Welcome to another in the series of the Recovery Curriculum Podcasts. Today, it's my very great pleasure to welcome as our guest presenter, Sharon Gray, OBE. Distinguished for her outstanding career in the field of education and particularly her service to the most vulnerable children in our society. Sharon had a spectacular career as a head teacher, leading a primary school from special measures, right through to the most remarkable outstanding. She built on this um, in, in her recent work through Wholehearted Learning, where she pulls on her often extensive experience in the field of special educational needs, and particularly with those children with social, emotional and mental health. She currently offers a range of support, particularly at a strategic level, Uh, and her creativity comes to the fore, as you will see in the following presentation. Sharon, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this podcast. Well, thank you very much, Barry. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. So, would you like to just tell us a little bit about perhaps the more recent work you've been doing and that's led to your thinking around what we're going to call Rising Strong Recovery to Resilience? Yes, I, I'd love to. Um, and so, well, as you've said, the majority of my, my teaching career um, has been working with um, children and young adults who are experiencing um, significant social, emotional, mental health difficulties. And indeed, my um, headship um, all, uh, across 20 years, majority has been in special schools, supporting those youngsters and quite frequently those, those schools were in challenging circumstances and needed um, support to be reconnected to create what would become a secure base for those youngsters and indeed the staff, the families, the communities in which they serve to truly flourish and thrive. Um, this, this opportunity came up because of my um, work that I tend to do around the biology of stress, the neuroscience, um, seeing through behavior. And this multi-academy trust I've worked with previously around, around that. And they were really concerned as to how they could reconnect their schools to becoming whole again, not just for their children, although absolutely forward facing with children first, but really thinking about their, their staff teams and how they could support during 
the lockdown during that period to have an emotional connection and therefore an emotional collaboration between them and stay strong during challenging times and then slowly come back into increased numbers of children and staff at school. And so the work that I've been doing in schools as a school improvement advisor, academy improvement advisor, and um, again, training around seeing through behavior, behaviors of communication, really sort of was brought to the fore in this piece of work with the Embark Federation, which is a federation in Derby. It consists of nine schools, although very quickly at the beginning of this piece of work, a number of other schools asked to be involved. So we're actually looking at supporting just over 14 schools and they range from EYFS, so early years through to secondary, and we have mainstream schools and special schools involved as well. So a real collective of um, fabulously creative and skilled staff working together to co-create what will be our recovery to resilience, rising strong curriculum and pathway towards the future. Fabulous. I know you'd particularly want us to acknowledge the collaboration with Matthew Crawford, the, the trust lead, and Sarah Armitage, the, the chair of trustees. Um, can I therefore invite you, Sharon, to go ahead and present to us rising strong recovery to resilience? Thank you very much. And it's about that the courageous, wholehearted leadership that Matt Crawford and indeed Sarah Armitage, the, 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 trust, the chair of trustees, has, has really enabled from the outset the, the cultural approach across the collaboration of schools in that it's very clear in the psychological safety of, of folk, both children and adults, to show up. And never has this been such a vulnerable time in many ways, but it's been incredible the way that these, these folk have taken on board the courage to say, yeah, we do not have all of the answers. We are not experts in recovering after a pandemic, but we together will find creative solutions that can support each other to maintain the courage of our convictions and sit that inside the vision that we have for our entirety. And so you'll see that reflected as I, as I talk through the work that, that those teams did with myself. And so the key um, part of this is, is, is how we retain those relationships with ourselves and connectivity. And I think that the Bruce Perry quote for me sums this up incredibly. The more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he will to be, recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. And this is a trust and myself as a leader, we dared to talk about love because we care deeply for those that we serve in our communities. And also we are not talking about training all of our staff to be therapists. We're supporting our staff to, be, to have the sufficient resilience to be emotionally available, to be self-aware and so be truly present as our children, other staff members and families start to come back into our schools that have indeed been open throughout this pandemic, albeit to smaller, smaller numbers. And we know through this time, it's potentially been one of such anxiety and people experiencing all sorts of different levels of potential adversity from not connecting with their, their families, their friends physically, and yes, we may have been able to do that on, online if we've been lucky enough to have the, the technology to be able to do that. But just the change of routines and the loss of the friendships, relationships has a, a potential huge impact. And how can we prepare for supporting everybody as we come back together? Because we know when we're responding from a place of fear and anxiety, that reptilian response where we're unsteady and cortisol and adrenaline surging around our bodies, we're not in that space to really think and reflect. And we're certainly not in that space to learn. So actually creating that safe place initially for our leaders to stop and take a breath and really regulate themselves, be self-aware, to be able to socially engage, be curious about exploring some of the issues that we're facing and then be able to logically reflect through and plan forward and almost model that for the entirety to create the emotional in containment for everybody that we're working with. And so thinking about how we work together to co-create 
an emotional wealth across the community, which Barry, I think is one of your phrases and the, <laughs> that's from your think piece, which I think is absolutely superb. Frequently we talk about, um, you know, poor mental ill health, but actually we're facilitating resilience and emotional well-being and wealth is absolutely crucial and a real potential at that time. And when we make those, those sort of psychologically safe spaces for real validation and attuning relationships, the energy that happens between people is quite significant. And what, what, what uh, as a result of that energy, what can happen for youngsters and for adults to truly show up and be present is phenomenal and will impact on outcomes in both the short and long term. And in many ways, We've got one chance at this and we need to get it as right as we possibly can because if we don't get it as right as we possibly can, the catch-up for all of us could be really quite significant and the impact on potential life chances could be affected here. So really, really important from that outset is how we develop the reconnection of those trusting, safe relationships that will become that secure base for future learning, which is, is what, what we're all about. And that's what we want for our youngsters and indeed for ourselves. So when we return to schools, it's about focusing on building experiences that bind us together, that, that supports all of our children and adults to rejoin in what will be a new normal. Um, I, I recently was reading some work from Rob Gordon, an Australian who studied the effects on schools um, where they'd experienced bushfires, for example. And, and he was talking about the state of fusion members identifying with each other because they share the same experience. They, they share and feel strong emotional attachments but because what they've traveled through, what they've journeyed through together, and therefore can develop, develop a shared culture of stories if they're supported to share and narrate their own authentic truth without shame or guilt. So it's enabling our communities to share their own authentic lived experience and do that in a a variety of different ways, particularly if we don't have the language or are able to articulate our stories. So maybe share it through a metaphor, for example. So thinking about that, how can we go through that coming back to reconnect, but also thinking about the normal. And do we want to go back to being as what was called normal or do we want to co-create a new normal? So at this time, seek for the positives, the hope, the glimmers of real fruitful outcomes that we've seen and we've learned from as a result of this real um, horrific pandemic that also sits alongside the huge loss and bereavement, but remembering that there are some real glimmers of of hope and positivity that we want to keep with us potentially and remind us of as we move forward. So this this stitching a new garment, garment and one that fits all of humanity and nature, our children, our adults will have absolutely seen the impact of lockdown on the environment. We don't want to go back to what it was before. We want to retain some of these positives as much as possible. So this is a complicated and complex situation that we're working with, a whole multitude of different ways to respond to respond to it. And so aligning the expertise and the, the teams that we have, including our children, absolutely key in that, in our opinion, as we move towards reconnecting children to their own personalised learning pathways. And so at Embark, throughout this journey, whilst we're evaluating how we're co-constructing our pathway, we're also noting that our our future learning curriculum, as you like, will be a learning pathway that's as rich in hope and humanity as it is in knowledge. And we are not going to let that go. We think that's really, really important. And we will honour the loss and the potential adversity, the bereavement, the loss, um, the the financial implication, so much that we might not yet know about, but we will honour that, but know that we're not defined by adversity and trauma. Life is tough 
And if we have the right relational support by our sides, then in actual fact, we can become stronger as a result of that and develop a resilience to go on to face other challenges in the future. And I liken this to the incredible Japanese art form, Kintosukori, where when a ceramic is broken or fractured, it's not thrown away and disposed of. Instead, it's, it's held back together with molten gold. And so the molten gold gives it an additional strength, uh, an additional containment, uh, a greater value and worth. And to me, in this situation, I believe that our school systems and communities are that molten gold that can reconstruct a new normal, one that is so incredibly powerful and of worth. And I think that's the only way that we can go through and get through this together. And I mentioned the lived experiences of, of individuals. And I think what was pertinent to our work is being really aware that, of course, we know there's a pandemic. We're aware of the increased um, numbers of potential domestic violence, um, alcohol um, dependency, drug dependency, the loss of income, all of those, those issues. And so when working with this, this trust and beyond with these settings, what we needed to find out was what is the actuality of the lived experience of our communities? And we needed to know that so that if we were to then think about what needs needed to be responded to and anticipated, then we needed to know exactly what they were and not just go on our own presumptions. And again, I find I, I love the use of metaphor, poetry and the creative arts. And, and this sort of um, analogy of we're all in the same storm, but we all have different boats. And some are lucky enough to have cruisers, cruise liners with their own pools in. And others have canoes with potential holes in the bottom and only one oar. And sort of getting a, a sense of how are we and how have we survived and to, to remove as much as possible the stigma of saying, actually, yes, I've had a really tricky time. My partner has potentially lost their job and for the first time ever, I'm in a situation where I'm, I can't afford to pay for school dinners anymore. And really creating that psychologically safe place for all stakeholders, being our staff, being our families, being ourselves as leaders, to say we are vulnerable. We are vulnerable because we don't know exactly what people need at this moment. So please help us as a leader, as a teacher, as a child, as a parent, as much as possible by being sufficiently courageous to share your authentic truth. And then we will do all we can to respond to that. And I think we, we felt that really, really important, particularly when we were thinking about doing potential risk assessments. We didn't know what the risks were if we didn't truly hear the voices of our, of our communities. And of course, within this, I mentioned previously about going into, if we're not careful, a state of fear and anxiety as the adults, and therefore responding um, in a way which isn't reflective of thoughtful processing, actually, it's more of a state of defensiveness. So co-creating an environment where the leaders and the adults can stop and breathe and regulate and become calm and steady. Because adults who are not steady will not be able to support and steady unsteady children and families as they reconnect with schools. So again, thinking about what creates a thinking environment, what creates an environment for learning and retention of learning in the long term. It's an environment of contained safety, emotionally containing and a sense of safety. And with that, the courageous leadership and in all of the settings that I, I've worked and worked, we, we've always said everybody is a leader, everyone is a learner, every adult is a teacher, and we all learn from each other. And so across, across this pandemic and as we move back, what we've put at the very core of the work that we're doing is peer mentoring, buddying, supporting each other, the law of 
propinquity, if I can say it, in that the more connections and the more we find we have in common, the greater the relationships grow, the more bound we become and therefore wanting to support each other. And so it's how we support each other, creating that safe place of being, but also that we can be candidly kind with each other. We can be sincere and open and honest and notice. I know when I'm in a position of real stress, I may well say to someone, I'm fine, thank you very much. And the music that sits behind the, the words that I'm using doesn't kind of make sense. And it makes people feel uneasy because they know that that's not my authentic truth. And sometimes I'm saying I'm fine, thank you very much. I need someone who I trust and I know who's looking out for me to gently say, I'm getting a sense of something else, Sharon. Not in a patronizing way, someone with that kind of courage that will help me to notice when unconsciously I'm not really aware that perhaps I'm not as regulated, I'm not in a space for real thought because actually I'm slipping, if I'm not careful, into a place of self-defensiveness. And we need our leaders to be self-aware and, and therefore support self-awareness across the community which is also about supporting self-regulation through co-regulation. So with all of that sort of trauma, sensitive, attachment aware sort of thinking based in the, the neuroscience and the biology of stress, we kind of drew it together into, okay, so for our trust in our communities, what might that look like? And about nine weeks ago, I had um, a Zoom chat and... Um, to think that I'm using Zoom on a daily basis now completely shocks me because I am not an IT whiz at all, but I've learned so much. And again, another positive to come out of this. If anybody had ever said that I would be sitting making a podcast, I would have just laughed out loud. And here I am. There are the positives that we will glean from this and take forward. And in this Zoom chat, there were about 60 school leaders and members of staff within the school team that the school leaders felt could really support in taking some elements of leadership to co-create the pathway through. And we started to identify what was really important for us in terms of group recovery. And the key one was staying connected, staying connected in the here and now and staying connected with ourselves, with each other um, throughout the future as well. Also, things like serving the context and community, finding out what the lived reality is, the issues, by seeking to hear the voice of our children, of our families, and our staff, and our leaders in a way that was accessible. Um, and so then how, how might we provide support once we found out the needs, moving into the logistics and what the return might look like, into some of the activities and the reconnection, to the actual curriculum and what will children be doing and how will staff plan for that as children come through whilst they're still facilitating online learning, into the new educational landscape, that curriculum of hope and humanity as well as knowledge, and at the same time, the professional development to keep our, 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 our staff strong and for this process to be sustainable. And so I, I talked with all of those leaders and gained their views about what was going well during lockdown, what they felt some of their needs potentially could be, and what they felt they could offer if we were to work as a, a collaboration, and a collaboration to um, be focused and, wherever possible, reduce workload, be really sort of explicit in who was going to do what, so we don't replicate, but also create the space for our adults to be connected to themselves and not get into that space of fight, flight, freeze response because of anxiety and stress. And so that was also another underpinning, underlying element of this journey. So we then decided we would put staff from across those 14 schools into different teams. And here we have what have become the nine teams. The first one, is being the staying connected and sharing good practice, celebrating the positives and feeding forward the key parts of any new guidance and how recommendations of how to, to respond. So, and that's led by the trust leader, Matt Crawford, uh, an, emo an ultimate emotional containment, holding things, um, allowing autonomy, but really holding gently and firmly, keeping us anchored in that psychological safety. 
We then had a, a team who were really looking at specific CPD for staff about the biology of stress, as I've mentioned, and the neuroscience about our own self-regulation system, our autonomic nervous system, how we almost manage our bodies through stress so that we could really support ourselves to maintain regulation and therefore thoughtful reflection as we travel through the journey and be as steady and as emotionally available as we possibly can be for greater numbers of children, their families and the wider community coming back um, for schools to become whole again. Our team three worked on um, creating um, questionnaires that automatically, as they were completed by all stakeholders, facilitated a baseline of analysis. So we had a 14 school wide baseline of analysis so that we could then take out key needs and from a very cost effective point of view look at how we could support sort of um, where there were themes across the schools but also we could do a bespoke analysis for each group of stakeholders within each school which meant that where we've got some very small village schools and then some very large inner city derby schools with potentially slightly different needs we could plan to respond to those needs in a very bespoke way. That group were also um, facilitating questionnaires that were accessible for some of our parents who had English as an additional language, some of our parents who are non-readers, some of our children with cognition and learning um, difficulties, some of our, our youngsters who needed social stories and questionnaires put into a, a, an accessible way because of their special educational needs. We needed to hear their voices too. And if I just pop across to Team 5, Team five worked together to create one risk assessment that we could support each other. So we were all working from a, a risk assessment that was the same across the trust. But of course, we had our own bespoke um, information to inform what would then be our outcomes of the risk assessment in terms of risk reduction. And so those two teams worked really carefully together. And as a result of knowing our communities and who are vulnerable were, vulnerable in terms of need, vulnerable in terms of risk, and certainly not just the vulnerable register that we had on March the 22nd, but actually we needed to know who needed immediate support as soon as possible in the here and now. And so we were able to get closer to that information. I'm pretty certain that we haven't got as close as we'd like to, but I think we're far closer by really facilitating a way to hear those voices. We then, team four, looked at training for staff, specific training um, about metacognition, um, supporting and again, creating safe places for children, looking at some of the behaviours that we may well see, um, children communicating their needs and how we see beyond those behaviours and become detectives to see how we can respond in a way that's supportive. Um, it's a, a, a trust and schools that is highly, highly inclusive and know the impact when, when children aren't at school. And so they've risk assessed, not just risk assessed children coming back into school, but risk assessed not having children in school and also risk assessed that what we don't want to be in a situation is where we draw children back into the school and then not in a position to effectively meet their needs. And then for some reason, they may not be able to be at school anymore. We know the impact of exclusions on children. As you're aware, Barry, my other role is with the Youth Justice Board, children in custody. And many of those children have been excluded from schools because their needs were not met. And the underpinning needs of those youngsters were more often than that, that they'd experienced significant adversity much like many of our children will have experienced through this pandemic. We need to be prepared for that to support those youngsters to regulate, to steady, to calm, to be safe, emotionally so, co-regulate, to move into a later position when they will be ready for their learning. And to do that, we felt our staff needed support. So Team 6, a very large team, um, co-created a library, and they continue to co-create, a library of resources, all dependent on age and stage and level of need, and an agreement that for the first at least two or three weeks, we're not looking at the academic subjects. We're looking at specific subjects, activities that will support reconnection emotionally, a sense of safety, getting to know each other again, 
forging relationships as we then bring more children in. And I'll talk a little bit more about that actual curriculum in a moment. We've then got a team looking at specific bereavement and loss and a graduated response to how we can support adults and children. Um, For some, they may may well have experienced um, significant bereavement. For others, it may be something completely different, but absolutely empathising into and attuning alongside to support will be the job of everybody. But some of our children, some of our adults will need that more specialist support. And so therefore looking out to multi-agency teams, what's available so that we can draw upon that as and when is is needed has been really important. Team eight is really about that that threading through what what are the learns, what what, what are the positives from this and how are we going to feed that forward with Team 9 really facilitating um, the support for for leaders across the setting. But as we know, everybody in our setting is a a leader and a learner, but really checking out that some of our um, senior leaders who have have really had to carry the weight of the accountability and responsibility at this time, checking out that they're okay and that they know it's okay not to be okay, but let's talk with each other and support each other in this sort of collegiate manner. So you can see here that they're the nine teams and there's a little bit more detail behind some of the activities that those those teams were working on. And then I, as a strategic lead with Matt, sort of met with those team leaders um, pretty frequently to be able to feed back, to support, to advise and do some activities with. In fact, um, one of my um, favourite activities that I'm doing at the moment is 50 sessions. I'm working with a team of um, eight support members of staff and two teachers who are incredibly, they're the the mental health leads for for some of these settings. And it's 50 sessions teaching children about their autonomic nervous system, stress regulation, the amygdala and all that. And it's just, they are the most creative practitioners, but they had been shielded. And they were living in a state where they felt somewhat guilty that their colleagues were in school with... um, key workers' children, and they were at home. But by giving them this this job and asking them to help in this way, and they are amazing, has has really given worth and focus and actually supported uh, emotional health and well-being journey. And they've really reflected on that, as have all of the staff, because as they've joined different teams, they've gotten to know more people across the school settings and therefore forge greater connections, which is what we're endeavouring to do as we move towards our recovery to resilience model. Here we have team two around the biology of stress so that we've created some webinars for those staff so that they can tap into those as and when they've got a, a moment and some time. Um, team three, I mentioned to you about those um, lived experiences. So we have a whole um, database where um, very sensitively managed with GDPR protections, if if there's somebody in the community who has experienced a bereavement, lost a a, a job or in financial difficulty. So we're aware of that. Um, And all of this is filed in categories of accessibility. So our staff will be able to access the, the resource library for sessions, our leaders, for example, in terms of what they need to know for certain groups of staff members or children or families. And then for those that are following the um, questionnaires, for example, they can access that library of resources. Team six is something that I I mentioned I'd spend a little bit more time on with you. And this is about that specific um, resource library for staff for a variety of reasons. Our children, our key workers' children have been in bubbles, um, and we'll know that terminology well, I'm sure. And those, those bubbles, as they've come back into school, we've really talked through what that may well look like for staff initially and then children. So, for example, the first couple of days, we just had our staff in, and they joined for a breakfast and a conversation, explore what the school looked like and created safe places and almost just came back together as an informal catch-up. Had toast together and a cup of tea and time to talk, knowing that we wanted to model that with our staff because that's what we wanted to do for our children as they started to come back into their bubbles. And then we've created a whole plethora of, of, of activities that teachers can take off the shelf, regardless of whether they've got uh, reception bubble of children or a year eight 
bubble of children. And it's all about reconnective type activities um, that those children can do. And our staff teams have done them as well. So they've really experienced the process. For example, one of those is um, every, every member of the trust and schools involved have a, a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. And on that piece of the jigsaw puzzle, they will reflect through words, pictures, metaphor, art, craft, whatever it might look like, what, what they've lost or what they've missed during lockdown. And on the other side, what, 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 made the, what enabled them to be the survivor and the warrior to come through this? What was the strength? And as everybody comes back together, we reconnect and put those jigsaw pieces together to create a, a school display almost of, of real um, visually representing coming back together and how rich and incredibly stunning that picture is as we reconvene. Things like um, a school of, um, uh, sorry, a sculpture of hope so that children individually can add to something that is developing and growing. And the other, the other idea um, was a, a working towards a longer sort of focused activity. So we will do some loss orientation activities and some restoration orientation activities and also something that we work towards that we can celebrate when the time is right where we socially can come back together as an entire community. Within each of these files, there is an overview of an index that sits within each of the files of a whole array of different activities. So, for example, film clips. Um, I'm aware that one of the pieces of work is around the movie Inside Out, and there's a whole range of PowerPoints that have been facilitated, activities to really explore emotions, and tiny film clips that support that. For example, reconnection with parents. You can see another example there, and, and a whole array of, of activities within there that staff can do, that children can take home to do, and support packages for parents. So this is a real library of resources, social stories, and they're quite generic social stories that won't take much tweaking to add photographs or personalization for children, for bubbles, and again, for specific um, schools as well. Therapeutic stories, thrive type activities, which is really about that sort of trauma-informed approaches. And just um, here are some, some examples of what the, the young people, both primary, secondary, special, EYFS, may well be working towards co-creating. And whilst you'll see a lot of this is, um, you see the jigsaw puzzle there, some really lovely um, big whole school displays, you'll also note one of the head teachers asked me um, if I felt her idea was silly that she'd made friendship bracelets for all of her staff team. It was something that she loved doing and she did on an evening, something that she found helped to regulate her after her 42 pieces of guidance that had tumbled into her inbox on that day. And personally, you can see um, in the left there, those little bracelets to say thank you to staff. And for me, how beautiful and what a fabulous role model just to express gratitude for all that our staff teams and our communities have already done and we know by expressing gratitude that has a significant significant impact on our own well-being and those that are receiving the gratitude and sets the set the scene and the tone and the culture for doing the same for our children to celebrate that they've survived through this monumental historic occasion and you can see the jigsaws as I say different pathways and the other thing that the children have been working on, again, across um, age and stage ranges specific to um, where the children are at and, and what they can manage and, of course, the support at home, are these COVID-19 time capsules, which I know lots of people are doing. And the children have been asked to just to collect in scrapbooks how they've experienced the lockdown. And it could be that they made a cup of tea for their sister. Well, that's great. Just put that in or a picture or they might have painted a picture or they might have made a collage or they might have stuck in the letter that Boris Johnson sent. So it's almost a historical overview of their journey. And at the same time, some of the staff team that are also shielding at home are creating their scrapbooks. When the children come back into school, they will do some more work around this in a, um, looking at the creative arts and physical activity initially as they come back in their bubbles so that they will all have their own scrapbook that 
you know, they can use with their children's children in the future because this is history. But also it's an opportunity to help and sense into how the children are sharing their experience, their narrative, wrapping language around that experience for them. Um, we talk, uh, Dan Gale talks about name it to tame it. These emotions could well be running wild and we need to support all of our, our people across our communities to be able to really share those, those stories. And stories have such a healing impact. So supporting our children to, to create those so that they can share and also, so that as the bubbles start to grow and we develop our peer mentoring and buddying systems, as new children join the bubble, they will have a peer and a buddy within that bubble, but they will start to experience some of those connection activities. So, for example, paint the pebble, do the jigsaw, whatever it might well be, as we move those children who have been in the bubble for some time into gently more independent structured routine of perhaps doing a little bit more of their time capsule for themselves. So we're starting a graduated response and approach back into the more structure and routine of a school setting in time. I'm not talking about going back to maths and English per se, but it could well be that some of our youngsters want to look beyond the science of covid maybe our key, key stage four children, maybe some of our key stage two children. And that's an opportunity to do that. So really kind of creating that kind of opportunity with a view to either December, possibly January, or whenever is appropriate, um, the schools and the trust and other schools involved come together to um, celebrate their school-based museums of hope and humanity. And so the entire community through the reconnection will have been asked to contribute. Children will have sent thank you cards, cards of gratitude to people such as the NHS and the doctors, the, the local surgery, for example, those within the community, and they will be gathering stories in the community so that everybody will then come together in each school setting to celebrate what is the museum of that that the school has, has gone through in terms of the history. And that's when they will also celebrate the, the co-created um, murals and the pebble walkways and the tree of hope and all of those types of things. So that there's also a closure to this and a, a real celebration that, that together these guys have, have got through this by standing side by side and together stronger. Again, some of the other activities that, that we're looking to, get to do are outlined here. Huge, huge um, library facility there for our teachers about outdoor learning and connectivity with, with nature and really, really using that as a, as a form of self-regulation and just connecting with um, the positives around the, the environment that we want to, to keep hold of. Um, therapeutic stories I've mentioned previously, um, various mosaics, which are uh, very, very little cost. We've got some of the um, local bathroom shops who have given their, the broken tiles so children can create mosaics together and just that opportunity um, of, of, of working through that. We've also developing a, a trust book of hope inspired by the Book of Hope, which was compiled by Catherine Rundle, beautiful, where children, staff, parents have already started to write poetry about uh, and, and to, to put into the what will be a published Book of Hope. Here is the Museum of Love um, that, that I mentioned. And again, this is just a little outline that you can look into at your leisure, really, showing some of the other activities that we appreciate aren't particularly innovative but actually are absolutely needed. And there are um, things around mindfulness, linking back to our ability to be, be self-aware, self-regulated, and therefore co-regulated, and free resources that are fabulous out there, such as Go Noodle, which it, you know, you, it is a free resource online for um, all ages and stages, and you just you put in if you want something to energize or if you want something to calm and regulate. And I think what's really key for, for us as a, a collaboration is we ignore the emotional needs of our children at our peril. Again, Bruce Perry, but we ignore the emotional needs of us as human beings at our peril. And humanity and that sort of real humane approach 
will be key. And so, yes, it's everything that we do. It's the risk reduction. It's the risk assessment informed by the lived experience, really heard as, as accurately and as closely as possible and drawn together in that place of real psychological safety, safety where it's warm and kind, absolutely, and deeply caring, but with that candor that we are being honest, sincere, and open to support the very, very best outcomes. And so, yes, it's everything that we do, but in the words of Banana Rama, as an 80s girl, it ain't just what you do, it's the way that you do it. And so what the, the, all of the schools have co-constructed together is the guiding principles of how, as the adults, we will endeavour to be with our children and with each other. And that's about the stance. And Dan Hughes talks about uh, the stance that adults are in, in terms of pace, playful, accepting, curious, with empathy. And we will be in that stance with each other and with our families, deeply compassionate, deeply empathetic, uh, and really endeavouring to hear what others are in trying to communicate and perhaps may not have the words. And I think that's really, really important. So being there, validating, attuning, reassuring, responding to and endeavouring to repair what could be potentially fractured relationships across a community. And we do all of that all of that before we even think about resolving. And we do all of that, all of that to create the secure base, the safe, the foundation of real regulation where our children can then be challenged to learn and retain that learning because they're in that space. So as the planet almost stopped, was almost forced to stop for a period and took time to breathe in. We needed to carefully, carefully breathe slowly to see what has unfolded and what will continue to unfold. And also to lean in, yes, with vulnerability, because we are not the experts in this, because we have not experienced this before. But we together can have the courage to find the very best possible responses if we have a really clear and as accurate possible view of what's needed. And that's going to take courage. So courageous leadership, absolutely fundamental. And of course, there's, there's huge concerns, huge concerns about um, the, the legislation and um, the guidance that's coming through. But what underpins all of this also is in all legal cases, the test of what constitutes good practice is whether a particular course of action would be supported by a reasonable body of professional opinion. And what this team of people have done under Matt Crawford's leadership with the support of the Chair of Trustees, Sarah Armitage, and all of the leaders across the entire trust have drawn together an incredibly experienced highly skilled group of experts, and they have become that reasonable body. We will continue to listen, to hear, to be courageous, and of course, with that, be vulnerable and respond and be nimble in our leadership. Again, I think, Barry, a phrase that, that your son has um, um, created there, which I used to use dance as leadership, but now I will always use that. We're on our toes here, but we're supporting each other through this nimble leadership, doing the best that we possibly, possibly can. And that is all that we can do and keeping each other strong by standing side by side and really identifying and celebrating the positives that come out of this. The soldiers, the warriors, our survivors, our children and each other. This approach is one of compassionate care, but kindness with candour, staying connected, rising strong from recovery to resilience. And I reiterate, we are not asking our staff teams to become therapists. We are asking them to be emotionally available for themselves and for their own families. 
and then to work alongside to be emotionally available as our children increase in numbers and come back into school and their families and the wider community. So I, I hope that you've enjoyed my sharing on behalf of the Embark Found, Fe, uh, Federation and the schools that are working alongside us with the Embark Federation, uh, an incredible inspirational crew, I must say. And thank you, Barry, because as you will be aware, thanks to you, because your think piece, your work on the recovery curriculum threads through very much like that molten gold that I spoke about that absolutely creates something that is so containing, something that is so strong and something that is so of, so of greater worth as a result of people like you standing up and, and daring with that courage to, to take on board this. So thank you. Thank you, Sharon, because this afternoon you have inspired us intellectually and emotionally. There was such riches in everything that you said, right through from the, the emotional challenge, the intellectual challenge, but to those very practical activities, that pathway of pebbles and the messages that children had inscribed there was just beautiful to see. I love your points about the adversity that we've experienced and how we will co-regulate, co-create and co-construct to find our way through this. And I'm sure so many schools will go forth and create a museum of love, of hope, and of humanity. This afternoon, you have shown us powerfully, through your humanity, that teaching is a relationship-based profession. Thank you so much for what you've given of yourself in this podcast. Thank you for listening. You can find more information about the recovery curriculum at www.recoverycurriculum.org. There's links to resources, reference materials, as well as uh, video slide decks. Barry Carpenter's webpage is www.barrycarpentereducation.com. And the homepage for the podcast is www.learningshared.org. You can email us at learningshared at theteachcloud.net or tweet us at underscore learningshared. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And please do get in touch with feedback if you'd like to either suggest a topic for a future episode or if you'd like to be involved in any way. Finally, you're welcome to join the conversation via one of our online communities of practice. We've got groups on Facebook and LinkedIn and details are on the Recovery Curriculum and Learning Shared web pages. You can search for Recovery Curriculum as a group inside Facebook. So for now, thanks again for listening. Stay safe and be well.